This is the Real Christian Manliness Podcast with Isaac and Tim Ingram. Let's get manly. All right, everybody, we're here with uh, Kyle Giddens, and most of you might know him as the unappreciated pastor, and I believe he gets no respect like most all other pastors. So uh, how's it going today, Kyle? Going great, man. Doing, doing super. Awesome, awesome. Tell us a little about yourself, where you're from, what your history is, so that people can know a, a little bit about you. From South Georgia, grew up in South Georgia, uh, never went to church or anything as a kid. Um, as, as a young man in my early 20s, uh, came to know Jesus Christ, he completely changed my life. Um, uh, he called me into uh, the ministry, uh, went and got a degree in uh, theology. Uh, God brought a woman into my life, married her, and pastored for 18 years. Um, and just recently, the Lord has completely changed gears with us, called us into uh, uh, foreign missions, and so we're excited about making that transition. Um, loving life, loving Jesus, and, and loving my family. That's that's awesome. You know, it's myself coming from a, a Christian background, grew up in church. I made a I made a profession at a young age, but it really, in the grand scheme of things, didn't mean anything. I got saved later in life, so I can. I can really appreciate that type of testimony. My dad is a first generation uh Christian and he he ended up being on the mission field for 20 something years maybe. So, I really appreciate that. Well, tell us a little bit about your um your your dealings with Twitter and and all that stuff and how that came about. Oh, well, I, I when I discovered Twitter, I think it was around 2011 is, is when we started or when I started the unappreciated pastor and the unappreciated pastor was just birthed out of years of, of being a pastor and a, a lot of self-deprecating -depre humor. Uh, <laughs> we can cope sometimes. Um, I'm a very sarcastic uh, person. My granny was really sarcastic, was hilarious to be around. My mom's very sarcastic, hilarious to be around, and I kind of got it honest. My whole family's that way. We just, we just constantly crack on each other and mess with each other in a, in a loving way, and so that was just kind of in my DNA. And um, that I just, by accident, kind of discovered, I think my first tweet uh, was, um, um, oh boy, what, what was it? Uh, I, asked, uh, I asked my wife, how was it to be married? How does it feel to be married to a preacher? She said, I, had, I, I have no idea. I think that was my first <laughs> first. And, and so that's kind of the way I, I look at myself. And uh, so my wife was like, what are you doing with that Twitter thing? And I was like, I have no idea. This is, And all of a sudden it started rolling and started rolling. And, and she just stood back and was like, why in the world are people reading that? She still has no idea why people think that, uh, that, that I say. Oh, that's hilarious. I can definitely relate to that. Um, you know, especially whenever you're a missionary's kid and you're rolling into churches every weekend and sometimes during the week. And you run across all these different types of pastors. There's definitely conversations that happen in the cars of missionaries when they roll away from certain pastors, you know, and and pr probably sometimes a little bit less respectful than they should be. But you got to be able to handle that with a little bit of humor, you know, because otherwise, you know, you go crazy. Well, I'm speaking in a lot of churches now. Um as far as going into the mission field, uh, that's kind of taken me to a place where I'm speaking in a lot of churches, and my wife's been joking. She said, you need, we need to write a book on what not to do with your church. <laughs> <laughs> that we're seeing in these churches. <laughs> so, I definitely understand that. Yeah. we. Uh, whenever we first started out on deputation with my family, I have two older sisters and a younger brother, and uh, the stories are hilarious. I'm sure we've left some of us behind and had to turn around and come back to churches, you know. Uh, but there was one time we were driving away. We had an old uh, conversion van uh, with the two captain seats. My two older sisters had the front two captain seats. My brother and I were in the back. And we drove away from one church one day, and my younger brother, he yells out the window at the pastor. He says, bye, Pastor Poo Poo, and just we rolled <laughs> off and my dad said, oh, we're probably not getting support from them, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. So, it, with the unappreciated pastor uh, Twitter handle and everything like that, has, has there any interesting um, opportunities or 
funny situations that have happened just because of that? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you get, of course you get just crazy people who yell at you. And you, met, <laughs> and, and, you know, sin's not funny. And, you, you know, you die without Jesus isn't funny. And, and we're just, you know, they just, they need some medication or something, you know. And, and so you get a few of those, but, but not a whole lot. Um, but I've got a lot of good opportunities to, to share with guys who personally message me about situations they're going through in their churches and been able to give some advice. And, and I tell you, I've met people. Um, um, I, I once uh, was, was going to St. Louis and, uh, and met a person through, through Twitter, and they found out I was going to St. Louis and were willing to pick us up at the airport. And, and I was like, man, you know, honey, this would be really awesome. we got these people who are going to pick us up at the airport. My wife was scared to death. What are we doing? We've never even met these people. And I have had people pick me up and, at the airport and take me out to eat and do amazing things and show me the cities and all just because of all of these crazy jokes that, that, that I've made. I've, I've got some free resources. I've had authors send me autographed books. Um, uh, you know, just I don't know why they feel sorry for me, so, that, so they sent me books and got an opportunity to meet some people. Got an opportunity to be interviewed on Christianity Today. Me and Church Curmudgeon got interviewed together. I don't know if you read that interview or not. Um, check that out it's in archives under christianity today and um i've gotten autographed um uh i've gotten autographed pictures from uh, professional sports stars and stuff like that where they've mailed to my kid uh (laughs) man so all kind of crazy stuff like that so it actually has been kind of kind of neat that's that's pretty cool um Let's transition a little bit into kind of what our podcast is about and about real Christian manliness. Um, tell me kind of briefly, what, what, what does that mean to you, having no context? What is real Christian manliness to you? Well, I think it really is being who God's created every man to be. Um, that's, that's what real Christian manliness would be in my mind. I, I, you know, I didn't have a dad. Um, I, um, uh, my mom was married a whole lot of different times. She was a bartender. Um, had a lot of issues going on with her. Um, never met my dad. He died when I was 10. I think I was 10 years old. Um, so the first time I ever remember seeing him was in Cassidy. Um, wow. So all dreams of knowing what a man was supposed to be, period, kind of went out the window uh, with that. Um, you know, my mom came to know Jesus as an adult after I was an adult. And, man, she loves Jesus now and completely transformed and, and changed. But... Um, I had no idea what it meant to be a dad, uh, to be a, a godly dad or a dad at all. Um, so when I came to know Christ, um, I really learned everything about being a dad and learned everything about being a Christian man just from, from the Gospels and just from, from reading the, the letters of, of Paul and, and looking at the Scripture. Uh, I think to be a, a godly man, it, it means to, to love God with your whole heart and, and to live as if you do. To me, that's what... And a Christian man is. Yeah, amen. That that's really awesome. Um, in in my line of work, we talked about it a, a few minutes ago. I deal with a lot of at risk youth, and it really hits you whenever you talk to a a kid, you know, sixteen, eighteen years old, and he says, you know, the last several months is the most I've had a male figure in my life, you know, and you really take for granted because. You know, I grew up with a Christian dad, one that loved the Lord and served the Lord, and it's it's definitely a blessing to come from that. And I I wouldn't even know where to start um, in being a man and a husband and a father without having that example, you know. And so, I coming to Christianity for you, I'm assuming, probably set you on the right track, I guess, as far as being a man and a father. Are, are you a father? or? I am. Yeah, I have two kids. I have two kids. Uh, it, it absolutely did. I was, my, my life was really spiraling, just going in a lot of crazy different uh, directions. I was, I was just about to turn 22 years old. I was addicted to about everything you could imagine being addicted to um, and just completely lost and, you know, ended up going over to my granny's house on January the 14th, 1996. I'll never forget that day. Uh, I went over there, and she wasn't a Christian either, but she had some friends over there who were going to church that night, and uh, they invited us to go to church with them on that Sunday night service. And uh, it really was the first time I'd been to church. That's hard for people living in the South to comprehend. I'd never been to a vacation Bible school or anything like that. I had no idea what church was. I tell people 
time. I'm like, you know, when I picked up a hymn book, I remember going to that church service, and I picked up that hymn book. I was so confused. Um, because I thought, like, okay, you read this first line, and then you go to the next line and read it. I had to what a stanza was. And yep. were, I, was, I was so lost in church, um, but I did hear the gospel there. And when, when I went home that night, I drove my granny home, dropped her off, and I went home, and I laid down on my bed. And I didn't know how to pray, didn't know how to do anything, but I cried out to God. He was just breaking my heart, and, and the best way I knew how I, I gave my life to Christ, and he completely transformed me, man. And it was honestly, I didn't know who David and Goliath was. I, I didn't know about the walls of Jericho. I didn't know Adam. I didn't know anything, man. We just, there was no Christianity in our family. And since then, it's been amazing to see how many people in our family have come, come to faith in Christ. Um, but, yeah, I am a dad, and I'm just trying to raise my kids the way I wasn't raised, you know, for, for the Lord. Wow. What, uh, being a pastor, what, what type of, what type of obstacles or what, what type of things do you have to take into consideration in raising kids in that environment of, you know, full-time ministry and things like that that you have to overcome? Well, it, it, it is difficult. There's no doubt about it when your kids my, – my kids are – my son is 17. Um, he's a wide receiver for his football team. He's a, ba- a basketball player. He's a very athletic kid. <clears throat> uh, my daughter it will be 14 this year. Take the ministry out of, it, and it's just difficult raising kids the, the way you want that God wants you to raise them. But being in the ministry, um, it's it's difficult, man. Um, there there are obviously a lot of eyes on them, and there are expectations. Even if you don't set those expectations on your own kids, there are expectations that are there that they realize simply because of the fact that dad's the pastor, mom's the pastor's wife. Um, it's nothing we ever pushed on our kids, but it's something our kids felt just as a result of of, of, of the call. One thing I did I, with, with my kids, though, um, I never made my kids do things in church. Like, like I never made my son, like, um, sing in choirs and stuff. Like, especially when they're young and everybody's doing all the little kids' choirs and stuff, you know. And everybody would, like, put a lot of pressure and I would always tell him, I would say, son, if you, if you don't want to sing in that choir, um, the last thing I want you to do is get up and sing in that choir. And then the reason is, you know, I, I don't I don't ever want to raise a hypocrite, man. I, I don't want my kids to be doing something out of out of some type of, of, of pressure that doesn't come from the Lord, but something that's coming from somebody else. Now, we've always said you got to go to church, and, and you got to come, and you got to listen, and you got to sit down, and you got to, you know, you got to do that part. But as far as all those extra things, I, I tried... Uh, not to push those things on my kids because because I don't think those things are necessary. I don't think that's what it means to be uh, the man and, and, and woman of God. But I tell you, man, my kids, I'm, I'm so grateful to the Lord. Uh, you know, kids don't turn out to love Jesus because their parents were great. Kids turn out to love Jesus because of the grace of God. That's, that's the only way. I, there are bad parents who have caught kids who love Jesus, and there are good parents godly parents who have, that don't. I mean, it's, it's the grace of God, and so we need to be careful, I think, about, you know, taking taking that glory away from the Lord. But what we have always tried to do is model that for our kids, model transparency, model, hey, we, we, we laugh at each other, we know we're all dumb, we mess up, we make mistakes, but but to be serious. One thing we're doing right now, um, I was going to mention this, this is a great little book, man. This is the, the New City Catechism devotional. You can, see that. can you see that? Yeah. Um, you know, as a family, um, we're working through this right now, and that's been a big thing in our life. We try to not just do it at church, but we try to do it at home too. Well, you know, our devotions with the Lord with, with one another. So, you know, the, I think the biggest obstacle is losing your family, that yeah. opportunity that, that exists because of all the pressure. But I think if you'll be real with God at home, all the fakeness and everything that you see at church, it won't bother him as bad. Yeah, yeah. That as a as a missionary kid myself, and seeing countless friends of mine go the wrong way, who grew up with every opportunity to do right, you you run through your head and sees like what what went wrong, what happened, how how could they have done that, and and what you mentioned to me, I never really looked at it that way um, about not forcing them to do the extra stuff, you know, 
me myself, you know, I always wanted to do the extra stuff. And that was just me, but um that that's a big thing. Also what you mentioned with the 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 hypocrisy and things like that. Uh, whenever whenever you see one thing at church in your family and then you see a different thing when you get home, that's I think that's a sure recipe for the kids going the wrong way and saying if this isn't real I don't want any part of it you know that that type of deal and it, man that's 100% real. That, that that's it and that's what we've always and that's kind of a little bit of the unappreciated pastor that, that's kind of burst out of that but let's, let's just be real let's yep. just be honest you know yep. and what, especially with my son my, my daughter is, has been been easier for me than my son and I think it's just it's because I, I had a mom in my life but I didn't have a dad in my life you know, so maybe perhaps that's that's the reason. But one thing I've always tried to do is make a lot of personal time for me and my son. Um, we we fish a lot together, we hunt a lot together, um, doing those things where it's just me and him. So he doesn't just know me as the preacher. But you know, that's awesome. As as his dad too, because I do think there's an obstacle there. Of of you know, he's not your dad; he's your preacher. Yeah. Oh, I was joking, like, we, we lecture our kid, and if we're not careful, we'll, we'll, we'll even alliterate the points when we lecture. <laughs> <laughs> you know why that was wrong? <laughs> Let me give you three reasons why that was wrong. <laughs> here, are the, here are the four reasons with chapter and verse that you have to make your bed every morning. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, since we've discussed a little bit about being a father, what 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 type of obstacles and things should somebody consider being a, a husband, and, and whether ministry related or not, that would be helpful to them in your in your opinion. Being a husband is the greatest thing. I mean, it, it is. It's you know, he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. It's, Amen. But if you man, I don't. You know, if you got a wife, you need to praise God that you got a wife, but you need to do everything to make sure. That, that, that you keep that wife. I, I couldn't do anything that we've been able to accomplish in life um, without the grace of God manifesting itself in, in, in my wife. Um, man, I think more than anything, your kids, they have to see that you love your wife. I mean, they need to see that. They, if they say, well, what, what does dad love? They, they all want me to say, he loves Jesus and Jennifer, man. That's, that's how it is. <laughs> yep. And he loves his, his wife. Um, being married is is not something that we deserve. You know, it's just like being married to Christ. It's not something we deserve. Is that relationship with Him is not. It's 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 the grace of God. But I always tell guys, you know, young guys, um, when I counsel them for for pre marriage counseling, I say, you know, if if you want to be alone, don't get married. <laughs> you know, I, it, it blows me away. I remember when I was in college, there, there were all these guys like in college who were married, and then there were all of us guys who were single. And I remember the guys who were married would be always hanging out with those guys who were single, and they'd be playing video games, and they'd be on their computers, and they'd be this. And then I got married, and I was thinking, man, there is no way in the world I want to go play video games right now. <laughs> 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 I'm going to go hang. I'm like, dude, this is the best thing in, in the absolute world, man, to have a wife and a woman that God has given you. So I, I would say, number one, you know, Man, if, if you want to be alone, don't get married. Uh, marriage is not for people who who want to be alone. Um, and, and you know, you know what Peter says: knowing your wife, loving your wife, respecting your wife. Th- those things are, are so important, especially in ministry. Man, um, my wife is, is just a super, super pastor's wife. She has been our our in, entire ministry. And and I'll say this: if you're a pastor, your wife. She will make you or break you. She will absolutely make you or break you. You're you're a team, and I'm not one of these people that believe the, believe the pastor's wife has to play the piano and has to do all this stuff. But the pastor's wife does have to love Jesus. She does have to love her husband, and she does have to have a great passion um, for the church. And if your relationship with her is not where it needs to be, that's that's probably not going to happen. So, man, I tell you, love your wife, spoil your wife, have fun with your wife. Um, you know, I, I'll give you a real quick story, real quick. I was I always teach my son, try to teach my son little things about marriage. You know, as we're going along, and we were in, um, uh, it was shop, we were shopping. It was uh, for Christmas. He was like eight or nine years old. All right, so we're out shopping for Christmas, and me and him hate to shop. Man, we just have some, <laughs> always a great place to start a, a small group Bible study would be on those benches in the mall. 
know, <laughs> just really reach men for Jesus there. So we're sitting on one of those benches in the mall, and I'm sitting there, and there was this guy, he must have been like 80, and he was there, and he had all these bags, and then I tried to say hey to him, and he was like, oh, whatever, you know. And so I, I looked at my son, and I said, I said, son, I said, he's probably been going shopping with his wife for 40 or 50 years, man. Every Christmas, I bet he's loaded down with these bags and all. And, and then here's his wife, and she had all these bags, and she dumps them off. So and this guy, he gets up, and he starts carrying all these bags off. And, and I looked at my son, and I said, son, I said, reckon why he keeps going shopping with her. And he looked at me, and he said, because he loves his wife. I said, bingo, man. <laughs> and I said, that's great. And, and that is true, man. Doing those things that we don't even necessarily love or like doing. Uh, why? Because we like the one, or we love the one who likes doing that, those things. So, man, yeah, you got to love your wife, man. you got to love her. Yeah. And w- one thing I think is... Uh... <clears throat> When the when the Bible says we're supposed to dwell with them according to knowledge, I I think that's more than just a head thing. I think that has to do with having fun and and finding things that you both like. And you know, my wife and I we like to go hiking. We like to travel. We like to go on road trips and shower and rest stops because we, we don't want to stop overnight and get a hotel. You know what I mean? Just just those things. And it's great just to be friends with your wife and and just have a good time because you know in my you know the way the bible teaches it's a lifelong thing so you might as well find ways to enjoy it so absolutely and understanding dwell with her with knowledge with understanding and, and, I, and i do and i mean i agree with you and i, but I think it also means to understand what makes her tick oh yeah smile understand what makes her cry understand what what gives her joy under you you've got to study her mm-hmm. he, he has to become one of the great subjects of your life and you study her and and you do everything to make sure that she feels, you know, think about, you think about Christ and you think about how, how he makes us feel, you know, so special, so adored, so loved. And man, we got this hard job of representing Christ in this relationship. You know, the woman represents the church. That's not that hard, man, because we're messed up, you know, yeah. but we as the men, we got to represent Jesus in this thing. And man, you, you got to make her feel like you so love her. Yeah, that's that's for sure. That's, and I, th- I think that's one of the biggest things that people need to do. One thing that men and husbands need to do is just to really love their wife and and show them how special they are. And I, I one thing that's always stuck with me. I heard a, a preacher one time preach about husband and wife relationships, and then talked about kid, you know kids in relation to their their fathers and mothers and they said that that men more than anything want to be respected and then women more than anything want to be loved right. and and I think that's true um <clears throat> as far as you know since you're a pastor I'm trying to stay on the same vein as far as ministry and family goes uh, what's the priority well, it's it's obviously all my life. It's been it's been God, and then my family, and then my church. One thing I've done, and a lot of guys don't do this, but it, it is it's worked for me. I've, I've been vocational, by vocational for a, a good part of, of ministry as well. I worked in a, a prison. I was a chaplain there, and so I worked forty hours a week doing doing that, and, and as a pastor. But one thing I've always tried to do, and I just left the pastor. Okay, so for, but for eighteen years, every Thursday. I'm done completely. I, I'm completely done with every sermon, every message, everything. That's because I take off on Fridays. Um, but every Thursday, I'm done, which means I may Sunday morning look over something, like for my Sunday morning sermon or, or whatever. Um, but as far as when it gets Friday and the kids are out of school and the wife's off work and everything, I'm done. I'm free. I'm, I've, I've never, ever, I, I honestly, I, I think there's been maybe five times out of 18 years of ministry where on a Saturday I've been working on a message. Um, it's just something that I've made a priority in my life that my weekends belong to my family. My work week belongs to my job. My weekends belong to my family. And I hear a lot of guys, I'm burning the midnight oil. It's Friday night and Saturday night. And I'm like, man, you know, 
chili's a lot better if it's done Friday and it simmers on Saturday. Monday, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and that's and I don't know. That's been one thing I've I've tried to do um, is just make sure that my weekends are open for for my family. Yeah, that's awesome. That that's very true. Um, do you think that? a perfect balance between whether it be ministry or work and family is possible or how do you, how do you see that playing out? I don't think it's possible. I really don't. I mean, we live in an imperfect world. I mean, we could ask that question. Is anything, is it possible for anything to be perfect in this world? I say, no, it isn't because you can't, you can't help that the phone call comes in. You can't help that a phone call comes in and there's been a tragic accident and somebody's died and you were going to go out to eat. But you just have to talk to your kids and say, you know, guys, I can't, I can't do it. But, but your kids understand. Once they've been your priority for years and years, but then two or three times a year it gets disrupted. It's not a big deal to them. But if it's every weekend, mm-hmm. it's a deal to them. You can't, you can't just drop everything because you know somebody's having outpatient surgery to get a wart removed or something like that. You, you know, you can't, you can't do that. I think that you can get very close to that balance. But, but I think don't think you can do it perfectly because we're in we're in the people business and people are really un, unpredictable and, and you just can't predict a whole lot of this stuff that, that that's happened. But like I said, your kids your kids are smart and your wife is smart and she'll know if, if this is something that's necessary for you to do or something that you just because you haven't been faithful the rest of the week now all of a sudden they're paying the price for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I heard one people talk about that same one person talk about that same subject, saying that being a husband and whether work or ministry is like walking a tightrope. You do your best to work to stay stay balanced, but sometimes it's going to sway one way or the other. But it, it's your job to make sure it do, you don't fall one way or the other. You just got to walk that tightrope, and it's all there's always going to be a pressure and there's always going to be a struggle, and that's one of the the burdens and responsibilities of being a man that you take on for yourself. Well, well, Kyle, I think it's about time to start winding it down. Um, where, where can people on this podcast find you? What type, where would you like them to look for you? If there's anything that you need to tell them or you want them to subscribe to your unappreciated pastor or anything like that. Yeah, you can go look at me on the Reverend No Respect, uh, Rev No Respect on Twitter, the unappreciated pastor. If you want to follow me there, um, uh, I'm not sure how, how long we'll do that. Um, you can jump at me on Facebook on, on Kyle Giddens. Like I said, if you're interested in, in what uh, God's doing in our life through four missions, if you're interested in finding out, you can find me on Facebook at Kyle Giddens. You can shoot me a message there, um, and, and I can let you know. Um, and anything I can ever do for any guys as far as uh, encouragement or answering questions about pastoral ministry, you can shoot them through through Twitter and personal messages, or you can shoot them through through the Facebook either way. That's awesome. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your day and being on this interview. And uh, I hope you, you have a lot of success and the Lord blesses you in your, your new missionary venture. I really appreciate that, man. Thank you for listening to the Real Christian Manliness Podcast. We hope you enjoyed our show. Now, if you could do us a favor, go over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating. That way, other people can find us easily in the rankings. And if for some reason you don't think we deserve five stars, give us whatever you think we deserve. But please explain why we got that rating in a review. Now, make sure you subscribe and have a great day.